So the next king we're going to be studying is King Tut. And he's the most famous king from Egypt, who is the least important king that Egypt ever produced in, in some ways. He's a, a really minor character in the chain of events, but he's kind of important because they found his tomb completely intact. We know that he is the son of King Akhenaten. There was some genetic evidence that proved that recently in the 2010 September issue of National Geographic. They actually have the evidence that shows that. And we know that when King Tut came to power, he actually restored some of the old temples and he turned his back on the Aten heresy that his father Akhenaten had installed. There's um, some evidence that, you know, or some people wanted to believe that King Tut was murdered when he was about 16 or 19 years old, and also that he had some kind of genetic disorder. Some of those things are partially true. First of all, he probably was not murdered. All the evidence that I've been able to uncover in various magazines and the CAT scans that they've done recently have shown that he was not murdered and that there wasn't a plot to take him over. There is a lot of evidence that shows that he had a genetic disorder, but it wasn't the genetic disorder that everybody at first believed was the disease, which is called Marfan's syndrome or Marfan syndrome, which sort of elongates the body and uh, makes your head kind of uh, oddly shaped. He does have an oddly shaped head, but that's well within normal genetics. He did have a bone disorder, and I guess it was sort of like an advanced sort of uh, joint disease or something like that. And he also had an issue where he injured his foot and had a club foot and necrosis, which basically means his foot kind of was rotted when he was a kid and gave him a club foot. We know that he died pretty young because he was sickly and also that he was married to his sister, kind of icky. Um, and we also know a lot about him because of how his tomb was discovered and the tomb was discovered intact. So there are two major characters that are involved in the discovery of his tomb. One guy named Howard Carter, and then uh, another guy named Lord Carnivon, and they discovered his tomb in the early 20s. The story is kind of interesting and starts actually with Lord Carnivon and Howard Carter sort of getting together. Howard Carter was the son of an artist who was vaguely connected some to aristocrats because his father had done some portraits of, of leading aristocrats and had a connection where Howard Carter was kind of an arty guy and, and was also interested in, in doing some illustrations and art that was concerned with archaeology and Egyptology. And so he was sent to Egypt to work for another lord. And while he was there, he actually ended up becoming very famous. And at, at one point, he actually becomes the director of Egyptian antiquities. There's some long, complex stories about it. And it turns out he was actually a pretty decent guy and was really interested in, in keeping antiquities in their place and really being good about preserving stuff. So we, the tomb itself is, was really well excavated and really well preserved because of this. So in around 1923, he is excavating in the Valley of the Kings and they actually sweep off some steps and they find these steps that lead down into this tomb. And the story is that he opens up the, the uh, tomb and he looks inside and, and uh, one of his assistants says, what do you see? And he says something to the effect of, I see wonderful things, beautiful things. He looks in and he sees this, basically this jumbled up storeroom. And the jumbled up storeroom contains tons of gold items, bowls of, of food that were half eaten. And it had been, a, you know, under attack meaning that someone had actually gotten into the tomb, but Howard Carter, or someone had, not Howard Carter, but someone had scared the, the tomb robbers off and it was left intact and recovered. So when Howard Carter starts excavating it, he finds everything the way it should be. And apparently things were just kind of tossed in almost like a warehouse. Maybe this was not meant to be the original tomb for King Tut. So he actually takes years and years to take apart the tomb. At one point, there's actually a story about him taking apart the tomb, and he wants to take the mummy apart, and the mummy was actually left in the tomb, I think, 
re until recently, uh, there's a story about him trying to remove the mummy, and uh, apparently there were some resins that had had gotten had leaked out of the mummy's tomb and had um, had leaked out of the actual wrappings and had sort of glued the mummy down into the surface of the of the uh, sarcophagus he was in, really kind of weird. And so he he brought the, the coffin outside, tried to warm it up, but he couldn't. And I think that's one of the reasons why they think that Tut was murdered, because actually it's possible that when Carter was trying to lift the mummy out, he, he was stuck so hard down that it actually shattered the back of the skull. The tomb itself is is pretty small for a king's tomb, and it's not a pyramid. You remember that all the pyramids stopped being built in the old kingdom, and then what they did was they actually built new um, sort of rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings uh, down into the bedrock. So when they excavate the tomb, they go down inside, and they find a series of rooms and basically a treasury, but the whole thing obviously was was a treasury. Some of the things they find in the tomb are, are really interesting. For instance, they find all these shoptis or these little figures of servants that were meant to be uh, people who were kind of serving the king after his death. Probably the most important find or the, the most well-known known find was the sarcophagus of King Tut and uh, the, the various coffins that were inside. So I want to show you actually on a website by National Geographic, a sort of animation that shows this. So you can see it's got an outer coffin, then various inner coffins. And these are all the things that Howard Carter would have had to take apart and then go inside. And then the coffins themselves and the inner coffins are nestled in there, almost like those little Russian dolls, one inside the other to try to preserve the body. And that's one of the reasons why the body is so well preserved. The mummy is another story, and we'll be exploring that in a little bit more depth in a couple of minutes. A lot has been made about the outer sarcophagus and Tut's mask, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more closely. For example, a lot of people have said that the masks um, and the sarcophagus itself really looks like him. Well, let's start actually with the iconography of, of the mask. You've got this cobra and um, buzzard on the top of the mask. And the cobra and buzzard on the top of the mask are traditional representations of Egyptian kingship. And then you also have what's called the cot headdress, which is this headdress that is almost cobra looking. It's, it's really more or less a, a cloth material, and that would have been wrapped. And in the back of this cot, the way that it's sort of made gathered into a ponytail, it was supposed to represent a cobra's tail. Now the mask, this is a kind of an interesting thing. It was uh, put together, and you can look this up in one of the older National Geographic magazines. They actually did a whole issue on this, and this was in June 2005, and you can get hold of that, and it has the, the new face of King Tut, and what they did was some CAT scans and did some analysis of, of his face and his body, and they, and they did one of those forensic reconstructions that's like on CSI, and you can see it, it kind of looks like him, you know, that weak chin and, and the sort of big forehead uh, and the large eyes, but it's not an exact reproduction. He's also wearing a little beard. That beard would have actually been tied on, and it's a representation of, of kingship. And he's wearing the cot headdress. This thing is gold and uh, turquoise and inlaid and probably worth a couple of million bucks. And you can see that it's meant to be a representation of his face that would go over the body and meant to preserve it. The mummy was found pretty well intact. And so it's a really good opportunity for me to discuss the mummification of Egyptian kings and noblemen. Now, by this point in time, Bob Brewer kind of talks about this a little bit. The idea that the nobles had become so powerful that lots of people were actually being embalmed and being entombed. And I think that probably still continued on a little bit, even when Akhenaten was in power. But when Tut 
comes to power, he basically restores the old order. So a lot of the priests had their, had their jobs restored and they were able to put him together. Obviously, the, the body was placed in multiple coffins to preserve it. There's an outer stone coffin. And uh, we also have these inner coffins with writing on the inside, hieroglyphs. And the method of mummification has never been written down. And so Professor Bob Brewer, again, for National Geographic Magazine, and I, I think the Learning Channel, put together a, a show about this. And that's where I learned about most of this stuff. I also did a little additional research. And it turns out this is how they mummified bodies. What they used to do was they would actually open up the body and they would use, remember that crook and flail that we looked at, which is this sort of metal bar. And you, you can also see it in the palette of Narmer that he, um, in the upper right hand corner, you can see that the god Horus is actually opening up someone's head with this metal bar. They would use that to remove the brains and they would actually toss the brains out. They didn't think they were valuable. But then the rest of the bodies were actually placed inside these jars, these canopic jars, which were just basically the internal organs like liver or heart, that kind of stuff was placed in the jars. And then what they would do is bury the body in some kind of desiccant. And Professor Brewer believes that it's a sort of almost like baking powder. It's a sodium mix. And you would, you would bury this body inside the sodium mix inside a, a, uh, a mortuary temple for a long time. And when it's finally desiccated, then they would rub it with all kinds of oils and unguents and perfumes. And then they would wrap the body in linen. And I think it took about 40 days for them to accomplish this. Then they would often put different layers of desiccants in the outer coffins like charcoal, sand, lime, and these would keep the, the moisture out, although there really is no moisture in the desert there. So it was a double whammy and actually kept the bodies really intact. So we have a lot of really good preserved mum mummies that are left over from this time period. And luckily for us, there was actually a priest who sort of gathered up the mummies when a lot of the tombs were being attacked in the Valley of the Kings and put them all together. And, and that's why we're able to do the DNA analysis and figure out who these guys were. An interesting thing that came up from analyzing King Tut's mummy is that we found out that he was club-footed and he had these bone diseases. So this attribution of this carving, which is done in sunken relief that in the previous lecture I had talked about, so there's a little bit of uh, a doubt about it. it was found in a different spot, is it's possible that it was King Tut and his sister who was also his wife. And the reason why this attribution has been made is that when they excavated the tomb, they actually found a bunch of canes and a lot of them had actually been used. And we can see that Remember how in the last lecture I talked about how he was standing in sort of a modified contrapposto pose, which is this sort of counterbalancing pose. We can see that he's leaning on a cane and it's done in Ank Amun's or Akhenaten's style. And it could be a representation of King Tut and his sister from a different area. And that kind of is, is interesting because it ties in with the forensic evidence that they found. Now I'd like to look at some of the other artifacts that you found in the tomb as well. For example, they found this pomegranate vase and it's made out of gold. And so it's kind of tough to do iconographic or symbolic analyses of works of art that were found in tombs and things because we don't have a guidebook. But we can kind of guess or make educated guesses about what these things mean and what they look like. For instance, this is a vase that's in the shape of a pomegranate. And pomegranates are actually things that have a lot of seeds and they come up in a lot of mythology. For instance, there's a, a Greek myth of Persephone who goes down to the underworld to Hades and uh, she ends up eating a couple of uh, pomegranate seeds and ends up, that's, she has to go back to Hades for several months and that's those are the months of winter. So pomegranates can be they're blood red. They have multiple seeds in them, an awful lot of seeds. And so they could be a symbol of fertility and rebirth and regeneration. And that is a possible explanation of why this vase was made uh, to look like a pomegranate. Some of the other interesting elements about, for instance, prestige items like this in material cultures that when you make something out of something really valuable, for instance, like gold, it also increases its intrinsic value because of the precious metals that are used. And this is true about other items.
for example, they they have these bracelets that they found in the tomb, and there's a, there's some really good evidence about, for instance, the scarab, and uh, that's represented on this, who is a representation of the god Ra, and um, the form of of uh, the scarab god Kefri, and so we know that there was this dung beetle in ancient Egypt, and the dung beetle. And you'll see a lot of beetles represented in Egyptian art and also in scarabs that were placed inside the mummies, little amulets that were meant to protect the body. And one of the things that they would find uh, is that these little scarabs, these little beetles actually would roll <laughs> a, a dung, a ball of, of poo <laughs> around and plant their seeds in it. Um, and uh, out of this ball of dung would would come this beetle, this beautiful sort of mechanical looking beetle. And so there's some evidence that suggests this for them, for the ancient Egyptians, was a symbol of maybe the, the sun moving across the sky and then rebirth and regeneration. So it makes sense that it would be used in a lot of jewelry. Also, when we looked at Snefru, this early period uh, py pyramid builder from much, much earlier, from actually just uh, in the uh, just after 3000, probably around 22,800 BCE, there is some evidence that one of the things that Sneferu did that was really significant was he opened up trade between the neighboring states and he went to Lebanon and got cedars and he went to Israel and other places to collect actually turquoise and turquoise was a very valuable stone for them and they really loved it but it wasn't native to Egypt and we see turquoise which is a semi-precious stone that's carved and put with gold and therefore the intrinsic value is actually increased by this. Other items found in the tomb for instance was this mirror box and uh, I believe there would have been a mirror placed inside and there's a sort of pun involved with the term Ankh. Ankh is a symbol of life and we can see that for instance in this image on the right hand side Horus is, is bringing Hunifer into the Hall of the Gods, and Osiris is sitting there on his throne. And Horus is, hand, is holding in his left hand an Ankh, which is a symbol of life. The term Ankh is also a sort of pun on the word for mirror in ancient Egyptian art. So it kind of makes sense that they would have used this symbol both as a mirror and also as the box to hold it in. And it's also kind of a good tomb thing to put in there because you would have used uh, an Ankh as a way to create everlasting life and probably had some sort of spiritual or religious power. One of the things that we had talked about earlier was this possible deformation of the skull. And we have some sculptures that represent King Tut actually coming out of a papyrus or a lotus blossom. And you can see at the base of this sculpture is actually a lotus blossom. And you can see the deformation of the head and that they would have found this deformation very beautiful. And this is one of the items that was found in the tomb. Another interesting element that in the reproduction, this sort of model that was made of his head, this uh, wax dummy or rubber dummy, whatever it is, is that they showed the eye makeup that was put around the eyes. And one of my students actually did a little bit of research and told me that she found in one source that they actually ground up some kind of precious stone. She thought it might have been lapis lazuli and that it was placed in the eye makeup that would be placed around the eyes. And that a lot of Egyptians actually got eye diseases from something having to do with the bugs along the Nile. And that the precious stone or semi-precious stone that was put in the eye makeup actually stopped people from getting this eye disease or this parasite would not be able to get into their skin or into their eyes and blind them. So it's another possible explanation of why the nobles and aristocrats had were in better condition and better health, although we know that King Tut was not in good health, that he had bone diseases and all kinds of bad things happened to him. Remember that this sort of deformation or this distortion of the skull, like I, that I said before, was not actually a genetic disorder, but just well within the, the margins of being healthy, was also shared by Akhenaten's daughters. And we see here in this fresco that apparently King Tut's sisters and, uh, and family all shared this same kind of distortion of the skull. And we see an image of King Tut's mother and father, Nefertiti, and 
Akhenaten, and we can see that in the reconstruction that they did, the forensic reconstruction, you can see that he shares kind of similar facial qualities to both his mother and his father, if we think that these sculptures are pretty accurate, and that's kind of a neat thing as well. So let's look at some of the other items found in the tomb, because I think it relates directly to the rebirth of the old order and the iconography or symbology used in the order uh, and how kings were represented. For example, they found this little chest, and on the side of the chest you can see that it actually has a little scene on it, a hunting scene that would have, and this was placed inside the tomb of King Tut. And the hunting scene and the scenes on the side all represent really the role of a king, and it's almost fictitious in how he was represented because of his club foot. He probably wasn't very healthy. And when you zoom in on one of the sides, you can actually see that it shows Tut as a warrior. And he is represented in hieratic scale. He's larger than everyone else. Flying above him to the left is Ma'at. Uh, we can see that there are the feathers of justice that, that are above him. And you can see flanking his head on either side are also these Ankhs that we talked about, which are symbols of life. So it's, it's King Tut victorious, even over death. And then underneath his chariot and before him, he's riding this, this wonderful chariot with these horses. You can see, I think, what are supposed to be Ethiopians or people from uh, the land of Punt or Nubians who are being run over by a chariot. And remember that King Tut's grandmother was Queen T, and Queen T was actually dark-skinned and from the land of Punt, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And we see a sort of fictitious battle in which King Tut is bigger than his enemies. He's, he's trampling them. He's running them over. And then behind him, uh, he's supported by his troop, who are just basically fanning him as he, as he goes in on his war chariot and destroys these people. And this is on the side of a chest. There's a similar hunting scene on the reverse side of the chest that shows him not just as a, as a warrior, but he's also doing the same thing in a hunting scene. So we can actually get a lot of the idea of how the king would have been represented in these scenes in, in representations of kings, that they are warriors, that they're athletic, that they're powerful. And we know that Tut was not athletic. He was not powerful. And in fact, remember, we talked about the Hebset festival with, of King Z um, Zoser, that he even had a court represented that was supposed to represent he was magically regenerated even in the afterlife. And King Tut clearly was not the leader that he was supposed to be. And for some Egyptologists, this shows that Egyptian culture, although it was fairly consistent and long, it was actually in decay. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see actually a representation of King Tut and his sister. And he is actually pouring out some kind of uh, drink for her, and he's seated on a little stool. And if you look at the little feet on the stool, you can see that it has little lion's paws on the stool. And you can see that it has kind of a leopard dressing on the stool itself. And found also in the tomb is this leopard style to, um, stool, and it actually has a little tail hanging off the back, and it's got leopard ornamentation. Now, it kind of represents, in some ways, something that's universal to a lot of different cultures, which is the idea that the that the king is like like a lion. He is the king of the jungle. He's a big feline. And of course, it's a leopard here, but we also find other representations of kings as lions, kings of the jungle. And so in this instance, we've got a leopard symbol, which is leopards are kind of important. Uh, another interesting story is the story of Ramses, who actually, when he went into battle, he had a lion at his right hand side. He had a, a pet lion. Imagine how scary that would be. And so the stool is represented or decorated to, to be a king's stool. And so it's kind of like a, a miniature throne that represents his power. There are other representations or references to big felines and lions in King Tut's tomb as emblems of his power and emblems that he is related in some ways to the big cats. For instance, this little amulet would have been hung off of a, a leopard skin uh, garment 
and it's kind of a little belt amulet and it obviously it shows a lion head and so in a way he's kind of king tut the lion hearted in this representation there are other representations of lions or big cats in other parts of the tomb and this relates to other cultures that are just very close almost very local located um, on the east coast of africa or actually the west coast of africa is another culture On the west coast of Africa, in this place called the Ivory Coast, is a culture called the Benin culture that I have a theory that they might have gotten some of their iconography from, from ancient Egypt. And so we see on the left-hand side, this is a representation, uh, is actually a prestige item from King Tut's tomb. It's an unguent jar probably used with some kind of perfume or some kind of... Uh, emollient or oil. On the top of it, you see that lion symbol again. And on the side of it, you actually see a hunting scene with a lion on the back of a gazelle or some kind of antelope. And so we see multiple representations of lions in and big cats, felines in the tomb. And in the right hand image, there's actually from that Benin culture, you see this hermaphroditic figure with extensive scarification. We're going to study this in a little bit more depth later. And on its shoulder is actually a cat or a lion. And that is a representation of its divinity or power as well. And so next time we come back, we'll probably take a look at Benin art and how it relates as a much later culture in 1600 common era to the ancient Egyptian art from around 1300 or 1325 before the common era later on.